Hi everyone, welcome back. This is Professor Hall. So a little bit different location here today, but um, hopefully better lighting. Um, so um, I noticed in the other ones that sometimes my face is just like the thing behind me, just a big white, white blank spot. Um, at any rate, we're going to be talking about Ender's Game today. Um, so a little bit different with the setup. Usually I have a PowerPoint for you for the um, summary. Um, this time I don't because really I think um, this book is pretty user friendly in terms of what happens with the plot. But I do want you to watch for that hero's journey, that cycle that we've been talking about um, where we have um, the hero uh, coming out of the normal everyday world, crossing a threshold into this adventure, um, going through challenges, finding that, that lowest point, that abyss, um, and then coming out of that, having kind of a rebirth or an atonement, and then possibly, not in this case really, but um, returning um, to... Um, their normal life or um, finding some kind of fulfillment in uh, a, a higher ranking kind of leadership position. So normally too, I give you a, a little bit of background about the author. I'm not going to do that this time because one of the videos that I have for you is Orson Scott Card himself. He's still alive, unlike our other authors that we read this term. Um, and he's in a in an interview and he'll talk a little bit about himself and his background so i'll kind of allow the author to to do their own um background on themselves but the first thing i want to say about this book before we dive into the summary and then we're going to talk about some of the technology used in the book and then my next lecture we'll talk about the social setting and some of the soft science um, aspects of this book the psychology which actually plays quite a large role in the novel and the um the social science as well so <clears throat> sorry so um the first thing i want to say is the subgenre which we've been talking about this term looking at different subgenres of science fiction and this is a hard science fiction or a military science fiction novel. Um, now, I mentioned that there are some soft science aspects of it. Um, in my opinion, they're really quite a um, prominent feature of the book, but it's not like Flowers for Algernon where we were just exploring those soft sciences. So military fiction, um, if you don't remember from, from week one, military science fiction is a subgenre which focuses on the use of technology for military purposes. So a lot of times you have people in a war, either on Earth or in space or interplanetary war, and the author is really interested in how technology, um, how weapons have been created for military purposes. The characters are typically members of a military organization, and a lot of times, the technology, one of the interesting features of this that I don't think I mentioned before is the way that the technology is um, represented is very often not that far from what we have currently. And certainly when I get into talking in a couple minutes about the technology in this book, you can see how um, from the 1980s when the book was published until today, um, even in that short 40, 35 year span, um, there have been um, a lot of developments that, that make the technology that he's talking about really pretty close to reality. So I think that's kind of an interesting aspect of this book. Another thing that I want to say um, is that if I can find the quote that I had here, just a second. Here we go. So this is from... Um, a professor at MIT, and here is what they have to say. Ender's Game is a deceptively simple novel. Um, first and foremost, a page turner, yet beneath that simple surface, Ender's Game and its sequels are much more. Ender's Game poses a powerful critique of the space opera genre relevant to our era of pinpoint bombing and push button weaponry. Like 
like Joe Haldeman's Forever War was to the post-Vietnam era. Card depicts a war less caused by conflicting interests than by a fundamental inability to communicate. Humans confront an alien race with a hive mind. Ender, the protagonist, must develop the empathy necessary to understand the alien em enemy and then use that insight to destroy it. Then he goes on to talk about some of the other aspects that um, we're going to dig into in, <laughs> in a moment here. But I wanted to read that quote to you because I feel like this is a novel that is, um, in my opinion, very often misunderstood. It's read almost like a pulp book. And because it is such a page turner um, that we do get pulled up into Ender's adventure. Um, also, the fact that Ender, when we start the book, is six years old. Um, I have some problems <laughs> with that. I think that um, he's supposed to be a genius and a child prodigy, but he acts much more like a 12 or 13 year old does. And then by the end of the book, when he is 12 or 13, um, it really is more like um, seeing someone who's maybe 19 or 20. Um, so you can kind of look at that as you think about the hero cycle that we talked about. But at any rate, um, yeah, it is quite a page turner of a book and we have a younger protagonist. So like Madeline Langwell's book, a lot of times it's pushed into this category of children's fiction or possibly young adult fiction, um, but there is quite a bit more to it um, and quite a bit of depth and um, it does set up a number of sequels. So let's talk about the book. Interestingly enough, this book, like many of the other books we've looked at, um, including I think Flowers for Algernon is another one um, that we talked about that started as a short story. So Orson Scott Card wrote the short story of Ender's Game, a very brief version of the novel that you have before you. And then later on, he was asked to um, write this book and he started writing a book called Speaker, of, Speaker for the Dead. And he found that he didn't feel like Speaker for the Dead really worked unless it was a sequel to Ender's Game. So he talked to his publisher and he said, I actually don't think I have one book, I think I have two, and Speaker for the Dead will be the second one, and Ender's Game is going to be the first. And his publisher agreed. And so um, if you like Ender's Game, um, <laughs> Speaker for the Dead would be a great way um, to, to um, finish that up. Or you can read the rest of the series as well. But I know a lot of people who like Speaker for the Dead more than they like Ender's Game. They think it's a little bit more of a um, mature or adult book, but I think they're wrong. <laughs> I, it's okay, but I really like Ender's Game. Um, so Ender's Game begins with Ender. Um, as the story indicates, his real name is Andrew, and he is what they call a third. So we are in a... Um, future, a near future, there has been this um, interplanetary war with aliens who we know as the buggers. And um, after that war, the world kind of coalesced into um, almost a one world government. There's some, some implications that there are a few um, outliers, but many of the governments seem to have come together. And we have um, almost an erasure of religion, almost an erasure of culture, not quite, but almost. And people are not allowed to have more than two children. So the government is um, allowing Ender's family to produce a third child because many children are recruited for war, or rather I should say um, an elite few children are recruited for war. Um, the oldest child in the family, Peter, is really sociopathic. Um, he shows a lot of um, cruelty toward others, particularly his siblings. Then the middle child, Valentine, is um, intelligent like Peter, but a little bit too soft. So this is almost like a Goldilocks and the Three Bears kind of situation. One is too hard, one is too soft, and then um, the family produces Ender, who is kind of just right. 
in that sense. So he is recruited by the military. And the first part of the book, um, well, the very first part of the book is kind of Ender's normal life, right, before he gets that call to adventure. So we see a little bit of what school's like for him, a little bit of what home's like for him, but um, really this inciting incident <laughs> of being called to come to the military happens quite quickly. Um, again, it's a page turner, right? It's not like one of our slow burn books that we looked at earlier in the term. So once he is recruited by the military, he is um, taken with his fellow recruits and it becomes very quickly apparent that um, he is going to be singled out that they have a hope that he is kind of um, the chosen one in a way, the person that can really lead the army. They, she, they see leadership qualities in him right from the beginning. And so there's a lot there that we'll, we'll talk about next time a little bit more deeply, but there's a lot there with the adults in the situation really manipulating things to try to isolate Ender and bring out some of those leadership qualities. So the first um, set of um, activities that Ender participates in for quite a long time, they talk about fighting in zero gravity. So um, he is with different groups um, and we see his um, interactions with various people as he kind of rubs some people the wrong way um, and makes a few friends along the way. So Eli and um, Petra and, and, and later on Dink and then um, Bean. So different people that he kind of allies with. <laughs> Um, different people he allies with, that's a, that's a bad pun, different people he allies with um, as he's going through this training, um, people basically that he thinks are intelligent and that he thinks have a little bit of kindness as well. So eventually Ender becomes um, the commander of one of these squads and then we also have um, in the second part of the book, we move from fighting in zero gravity to looking at battle simulations, um, kind of almost like a, a video game. While all of this is going on, um, back on Earth, we have um, Valentine and Peter as they are trying to kind of find their own way um, and get a little bit of recognition as well. And essentially what happens is that they begin to um, pose as people online and um, drum up political support so that eventually they can move into political positions once they are older. And that's basically all I kind of want to say about this book, I don't want to get into too many more details. Um, as I said, it's not like some of the, you know, the proto science fiction we looked at earlier in the term where things were a little bit more complex and, and, and difficult to understand. The plot is pretty easy to follow, but I do want you to watch for those points. What is Ender's normal life? Um, why is he hesitant to, to take the call? That That's a hesitation that kind of follows him throughout some of the book. Um, the call to adventure, who are some of his mentors, and how do we have a little bit of playing around with um, uh, what a mentor is and how they should be and how they should help you and how they're kind of not helping him. Um, how does he find mentors in some of the other children? Um, in what ways does he go through challenges? What's that abyss? What's that darkest, lowest point? Um, and then how does he come um, out of that lowest point and and how is he changed by the end of the book so those are basically some things I'd like you to look for um, and next time we'll talk briefly about some of the technology used in the book and then we'll look at um, as I mentioned some of the social science aspects of this